the Canon EOS M5. This is Canon's mirrorless system. Yes, they have mirrorless cameras. <laughs> They're APS-C cameras. They're, so the sensors are, are the same size as your 80D or your 70D, but smaller than your 5D and your 6D cameras. Very good image quality. And I just want to post a correction because a couple of weeks ago, I posted a video about consumer cameras and I said the EOS M series is dead. Turns out there's still a little bit of life left in it, but I think you can understand my confusion because it's like, have you ever been dating somebody and they just don't respond to your texts anymore? And then like after a couple of weeks, you're like, I, I guess we're just not dating. <laughs> Canon, when they released the last EOS camera, the M3, they didn't even release it in the US initially. And then like a year later, they started selling it in the US. And they've only ever made seven lenses for the whole system. So I guess that that's why I thought EOS M was dead, but here it is, the M5, and it's actually kind of an interesting camera. L let's take a look at it. We've worked with basically every part of this camera, even though we don't have it for review right now. Um, subscribe, and I'm sure we'll get a hands-on with it very quickly. This is a live broadcast, so you can actually tweet and use the hashtag TC Live, and our producer, Justin, can toss your tweets on screen as long as you're watching live. Uh, let's get into the stats of it. First, the design of it seems to be based on the uh, 1990 Canon <laughs> uh, design aesthetic, which is bulbous and uh, bouncy and plasticky. And keep in mind, it's a mirrorless camera. So this bump you see at the top here, that's for a prism that's required for DSLRs or SLRs in general. And it doesn't need that. So they put that bulbous thing at the top just for aesthetic purposes because they think that looks good i guess I, I will say that it tells you something about the market that they're trying to appeal to here and that's people who want an slr but maybe want something smaller um, but people still want to feel like they get a real camera into some people it has to look like like this like an add or a traditional 90s slr style or it doesn't seem like a real camera i don't think that's true like i feel like all these are real cameras the body alone is a thousand dollars and that's a really high price point and this is actually very consistent with what i said in the death of the consumer camera video because what i said was the bottom end of the market was falling out and what we'll see is only higher end medium and high end cameras and a thousand dollars is a lot it's the highest they've ever charged for one of these eos m cameras with a basic kit lens it's eleven hundred dollars uh good wide angle lens 15 millimeters there and uh with a more telescopic zoom, it's coming in at $1,500. So you're talking about expensive prices here. It should be available November 30th, 2016. Now, this is the first EOS M camera to actually use Canon's dual pixel AF, which is kind of shocking because it's been, it was in the Canon 70D and it's in the Canon 80D as well as the T6S and the 5D Mark IV, the 1DX Mark II, and it's fantastic. You really can touch the screen and it will, immediately and smoothly focus. It's fantastic for video. And even if you use live view on the your DSLR, it will work pretty well and focus pretty quickly. It's still not as good as focusing with a viewfinder because when you use the viewfinder in a DSLR, it has a phase detect, dedicated off sensor phase detect sensors that are bigger than those little dual pixel AF sensors. But Canon does a great job with dual pixel AF. Switch between a Nikon Live View and a Canon Live View, and you'll see the difference because Nikon is very clumsy and slow, and Canon's technology here is novel and fast. And I'm excited to see it in a mirrorless camera and to see how it really compares to like the amazing focusing system in the, the Fuji X-T2. Um, so that means that the focusing system here will be usable, and I don't know if it will track a sprinter at dark because if you notice at the end of that video, they said, the images were simulated, so we'll test it and find out for you. Canon added focus speaking to this, and if you haven't used focus speaking, it's a, a, a tool that filmmakers have used for a long time to show you when you're manually focusing what part of the frame is in focus. And to me, by them including this, finally, this is the first uh, real like stills camera that they included focus speaking in. To me, it says they're trying to appeal more to filmmakers with this camera. I'm shocked that they have focus peaking and they decided to exclude it from the 5D Mark IV that just came out. I'm also shocked that they waited so long because if you used um, Blackmagic 
with the old 5D Mark II Black Magic or Magic Lantern. I'm sorry, Black Magic Lantern was a free hack that would add things like focus peaking and like our Sony cameras and basically every mirrorless camera ever has had focus peaking. But this is a first for Canon. So let's let's be optimistic and think now that Canon has that software, maybe they'll push out firmware updates to other cameras. That would be very uncanon like, but maybe it'll happen. Five axis stabilization. And if you look at the marketing material and you look at this cool graphic here, you would quickly conclude that it is similar to the sensor stabilization that's built into Sony, Pentax, Olympus, Panasonic cameras. And we have loved sensor stabilization. You know why? Because you can put a fast, unstabilized prime on there, and then suddenly it has image stabilization. And it means that the camera manufacturers don't have to design lenses with stabilization built in, which means they can focus on making higher quality, lower cost optics. Sensor stabilization is fantastic. And this does not have sensor stabilization. You, I would understand you being confused. It even feels misleading to me. But what Canon is doing is they're offering digital stabilization for video, which means the video is cropped a little bit, but if you move the camera up, it will move it up the, up the part of the sensor that it's reading. So it's not as good as optical stabilization. It's not as good as sensor stabilization, but it does help smooth video out. It will do nothing for your stills and it only works with stabilized lenses. So if you have some hopes of sticking an unstabilized prime on there and benefiting from it, forget it. Um, I feel like this is like, Somebody in the marketing marketing department said, hey, all these other manufacturers are offering sensor stabilization. We need to do that. And engineering came back with, mm, we can say we do it. <laughs> uh, it is offering uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and NFC wireless technology. So you can see Canon, they're, they're adding Bluetooth. That's something they have never done before. And you can see that Canon is trying to respond to Nikon and Snapridge, as well as this massive effort for smartphones to basically slaughter the existing camera industry. They're trying to make the camera more connected to the smartphone. And a big part of their marketing is going into showing you this. The novel part about this is the Bluetooth. Uh, Snapbridge uses Bluetooth to actually slowly transfer pictures in the background. Bluetooth is nice because just like your smartwatch and your smartphone can maintain a constant connection, Bluetooth will allow your smartphone to maintain a constant connection to your camera. Now, I don't believe that the Bluetooth is actually transmitting files in this case. I think what's going to have to happen is you'll use the Bluetooth to allow the camera and smartphone to maintain a connection so you can more easily switch to Wi-Fi when you need to. The benefit of Wi-Fi is that transfers happen much faster. But the huge drawback to Wi-Fi is the way smartphones work now is when your smartphone connects to your camera's Wi-Fi, it completely disconnects from the internet. That It doesn't have to work that way, but every smartphone I've used, iOS and Android, when you connect your Wi-Fi to your camera, it disconnects you from the internet. And that means you transfer your pictures from your camera to your phone, and then you have to manually disconnect that Wi-Fi just to get them back on, get to post those pictures to Instagram or Twitter or whatever. So it becomes a kind of a clumsy process, but the Bluetooth here is definitely going to make things easier. And I, again, I don't know why they put Wi-Fi in the 5D Mark IV, but didn't include Bluetooth because pros are posting stuff to social media and making that process easy would definitely help. But nonetheless, I'm glad Canon has this technology now and I hope to see it in future cameras. They put a selfie screen on this camera, but they did it in a weird way. Now, if you look at the Canon 80D, this is basically an 80D. It has the same sensor as the 80D and most of the same features. It's just mirrorless. But on the 80D, you can flip it out like this, and that means you can flip the screen towards your talent if you're a cameraman, or you can film yourself and watch what's going on, or you can take selfies by turning it around back towards yourself. The selfie screen flips out from the bottom here and I never understood why you'd want this over having it flip out from the side but nonetheless it works and if you're hand holding it it can be fine but there's one big drawback here and pardon my terrible mock-up but if you mount it to a tripod it's going to be blocking the screen <laughs> so I mean they, they want this for vloggers who are filming themselves but vloggers won't always be hand holding it sometimes a vlogger sticks it on a tripod and that case you just won't be able to see the screen. Weird, weird design choice. And then another new feature for Canon that they kind of borrowed from Panasonic is, is touch focusing. So while you're looking through the viewfinder, you can drag your finger across the touch display and actually change focusing points. And 
that is their kind of answer to not putting a proper thumbstick on the back of the camera. I would like both a thumbstick and that. Um, this is another thing that Canon could push out through firmware updates to their other touchscreen cameras, but again, I wouldn't hold my breath because that's not really Canon's way. <laughs> they don't give you free updates. Uh, nonetheless, it's a cool technology that I hope to see in future cameras because it's it's a nice to have. It's it's more of an analog way rather than like clicking a thumbstick multiple times to point, 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 which can be really slow when you need to move from one side to the other. It's more like using a mouse where you can just swipe it quickly and get from one side to the other. I'm glad they borrowed that from Panasonic. The video is going to be a huge disappointment for people. It's 1080p and 60 frames a second, which is real old technology. Our channel has been mostly 4K videos for over two and a half years now. <laughs> two and a half years since the beginning of 2014. Uh, this video is not in 4K, but most of our videos are. And check out sdp.io slash y4k, the letter y4k. If you want to find out why 4K is useful, nonetheless, it doesn't have 4K like most of its competitors do. It will shoot at seven frames a second with the dual pixel AF autofocusing or nine frames a second without autofocusing, which is, is decent. That's good for a DSLR. Here's a picture of the entire lens lineup for Canon EOS lenses. There are seven and they're introduced, introducing a couple new ones. Now, Seven lenses, I, I could get by on seven lenses, no problem. But the thing is, these are all very consumer-oriented lenses. So these longer zooms are actually f6.3 on the long end. And then you have to count a 1.6x crop factor. So you can bet that you're not going to do any like low-light sports or anything with it, at least not with good results. And they don't have any f4 zooms. They don't have any f2.8 zooms. And they certainly don't have like f1.8 zooms. No, we're at f5.6 and f6.3. So they're all really slow kind of consumer zooms. And that tells you something about the system. Um, the, the weird conflict here is this is a thousand dollar camera that seems uh, pitched towards high, higher end enthusiasts and filmmakers. And yet all the native lenses for it are really, really low end and Canon in isn't introducing any more high end lenses. Um, now, Canon does allow you to use an adapter which is only like 120 bucks to allow you to put Canon DSLR lenses on. Um, but at that point, the camera is just as big and clunky as a DSLR. And you kind of wonder like, why aren't you using a DSLR? Well, one, one answer might be because you have an EVF and it's entirely possible for Canon to put a proper electronic viewfinder on a DSLR so you can get the best of both worlds, but they haven't. So right now, if you want, a Canon camera with an electronic viewfinder and you don't want to buy a high-end video camera, the uh, EOS M5 is it. And for that reason, it might be a decent solution. Now, I mentioned it has 24 megapixels because it's the same sensor as the Canon 80D, which has a decent sensor. It doesn't hang with basically all of the competition <laughs> like Sony, but it's a decent sensor. To give you a sense for the size, this is from camerasize.com. That's the 80D on your left there, and then the M5 in the middle and the Sony a6300 on the right. You can see it's clearly meant to look and feel like a DSLR. It's not as small as a small mirrorless camera. It's somewhere in between. I mean, I don't feel like my mirrorless cameras need to be tiny because when I do use tiny mirrorless cameras, I always, when I'm actually using them, I always think, oh, I wish the grip were a little bit bigger. I wish it had more buttons and stuff. So I don't mind that. I think this is a good size compromise. This is a top view. And it's showing that as you start to attach lenses to these tiny mirrorless cameras, the size benefits really disappear. And the fact is the ADD there on the left, it is definitely bigger with that lens, but the lens is also faster and better than the one you could get for the M5 here. When you put, we found that when you get glass that produces the same results, it's going to be the same total size. So if you're out and about, sometimes you end up putting the camera uh, like, on your table while you're having lunch. And it is nice to have a camera that doesn't take up the entire table. <laughs> I appreciate a smaller camera. Let's compare the M5 to its brother, the Canon 80D. The 80D, about 200 bucks more expensive, though you can just pick one up used and it would be about the same price. The M5 has an electronic viewfinder while the ADD has an optical viewfinder. And that's going to be the biggest difference. The optical viewfinder has absolutely no lag. So if you're shooting sports or something, uh, that, that helps you keep the subject in the frame. It's kind of, 
there are electronic viewfinders that do well for action, but I think everybody still prefers an optical viewfinder, especially for things like wildlife. But the electronic viewfinder previews your exposure in real time, meaning you don't have to take a picture and then chimp to see if you nailed it. You already know that you nailed it. If you forgot your exposure compensation was turned up three stops, it'll be immediately obvious when you look through the viewfinder. Whereas if you look through the viewfinder of any DSLR, including the ADD, you can easily take 20 pictures all overexposed and not realize it until you go back and actually chimp. The M5 is smaller and it has the new Bluetooth Wi-Fi system, which should make transferring pictures a hair easier. The ADD, however, one of the benefits of that size is it's bigger, it has better controls, it has a, a top display, um, and while you're using the optical viewfinder, the focusing will be far superior, much better, better for tracking fast moving subjects, especially with big telephoto lenses. Also, if you want to use the real Canon lens lineup, you don't have to stick an awkward adapter on there. If we compare the M5 to the A6300 here, the A6300 obviously smaller, it's about the same price, and looking, I know, DX Mark, I know, I know, but this is our, this is consistent with our own testing, it's about 27% cleaner, the A6300 also has better dynamic range, and it's in a smaller package. So if that's what you're about, if you're a pixel peeper, you definitely would be happier with the A6300. But the M5 has some advantages over that. It's a little bit slower. It doesn't have 4K, um, but it has a touch screen and a selfie screen. And those, for filmmakers especially, are really important things. So the usability is going to be better, even though the video quality will be substantially worse. The A6300... Even in HD mode, it offers 120 frames a second, which I think is just really cool because you can make awesome slow motion clips that you can mix into your videos. And it's a common cinematography technique that has a real impact. And that's not something you can really do with the M5. So I, I totally wish they would crank up the uh, recording speed on this. I'll also point out that the A6300 and the Sony E-mount system has a much better lineup than the M5 system. It's, it's the lenses that really stop me from recommending the Canon EOS M system because I, the adapter seems pointless. Why not use a DSLR at this point? And the lenses themselves are very, uh, very low-end consumerish gear, and that's not really the people who ask me about cameras. Let's compare the Canon M5 to the Panasonic GX8. The Panasonic GX8, as you can see, has a smaller sensor. It's, it's a micro four-thirds camera. Uh, so your still images wouldn't have quite the same quality. But the GX8 has 4K with a bit of a crop. It has the EVF over to the left, which, which means that it's like this camera. It means that it doesn't bump against your nose if you use your right eye, if you use your left eye. It's actually easier to have a viewfinder in the middle, but I, because I use my right eye, I actually prefer the viewfinder to be over here. The GX8 also has a fully articulating screen, which we prefer, like the ADD. It has real sensor stabilization, not just marketing talk sensor stabilization. It, and because it's micro four thirds, it has vastly more lenses. There's such an amazing collection of lenses available for micro four thirds cameras. So for most people, I would definitely push them towards the GX8. We love those cameras. The usability is fantastic and they win in just about every way, except the stills won't be quite as good. But actually, because you can put better lenses on it, you might be able to get much better stills on it. Like there are F2.8 zooms and really fast primes and you can get great bokeh with them. And um, I will say that I've used the dual pixel AF that is in the M5 and it's better than you'll get in the GX8. Nonetheless, for still subjects, the focusing in the GX8 is just fine. It's just you wouldn't want it for tracking action. So what are we disappointed with in the new M5? Well, a big part of focusing with one of these mirrorless cameras, especially for portraits, is getting the eye in focus. And in Fuji and Sony and in the Micro Four Thirds worlds, we have the cameras have eye detect where they'll find the eye and focus on it. The Canon has face detect, and that's fine for the lenses that the Canon is currently offering. But if you were to try to adapt like a 7200 f2.8 or some lens with shallow depth of field, you would that would be insufficient. The camera would be focusing on the face, which might mean the nose or the forehead, and it would be a little bit out of focus, but because Canon doesn't actually have those types of lenses, maybe it's not a problem. With the 5D Mark IV, Canon introduced HDR video, which is cool. It means instead of the sky being blown out, the sky can be nice and blue. And it's very like an amateurish, consumerish type technology, and this camera is kind of 
consumerish. So why not put that in there? I wish they would have. It could have done it. Of course, as I mentioned, no 4K video. Um, also, no zebras. It's weird because focus peaking and zebras, they go together for filmmakers and it's super easy. Zebras just highlight parts of the picture that are overexposed when you're recording video. I don't know why they didn't put that in. No headphone jack. Again, for a video centric camera, I know not everybody listens to their audio, but even if you're vlogging and filming yourself, it's nice to record yourself and then just listen back to make sure you got the sound and that there was, wasn't wind blowing right in the mic or a jackhammer behind you that you didn't notice. So you won't be able to just play back the audio except through the little mono speaker that it has. A headphone jack is easy to put in and nice to have, and it's not exactly the new iPhone. Like it doesn't have Bluetooth headphones or anything you can connect to it. You're just out of luck. As I said, no real sensor stabilization and no GPS. I love GPS and cameras because you can import your pictures and see everything on a map. They added a low pass filter, which makes your pictures a little bit less sharp, but is kind of actually preferable for video. Um, they have a new touchscreen and their marketing material is really talking about how you can touch the menus and stuff. And it's clear they're trying to pull in the smartphone crowd by making them think, oh, it has a touchscreen just like your smartphone. You can touch stuff. But the touchscreen is super, an or the, the user interface is super antiquated. You're still looking at like literally 1990s menu style systems and you're touching them. It's, you can't like swipe through menus. And if you have to use the keyboard, it's a nightmare. For filmmakers, we like to use a, a, a logarithmic scale that captures more dynamic range. This allows you to prevent the sky from being blown out and still get good details in the shadows because our eye can perceive more dynamic range than most cameras can. Canon has something they call Canon Log, C-Log, which provides this, which allows you to capture all of that and then fix it in post. They, they didn't put it in this camera. If you're interested in ordering the M5, use our link, please, sdp.io slash M5. Subscribe to see more reviews. We'll have a lot of review videos coming out this week because of Photokina. And uh, give me a like. Uh, any questions, add a comment. Thank you. Bye.